Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Well, there's a lot of emphasis on being physically fit. And while that's very important, it's just as vital that we exercise our mental fitness. So today we have a message that's going to teach you how to work out your mind. Jesus did not just die for us so we could have our sins forgiven and someday in the sweet by and by go to heaven, get a mansion and float around on a cloud and sing songs with angels. That's probably the most important part that our sins are forgiven and that we're going to get to live with him for eternity, but there's an in-between. And he cares about the in-between and he died for the in-between also. And he did not just die so I could be saved or you could be saved, but that everything that we've lost through the fall, through sin, through ignorance, through abuse, through rejection, through pain, that everything that we've lost can be restored. And we know that restoration is a process. Transformation is a process. It takes time. And it's not just something that God just does while we sit idly by and do nothing. We have to cooperate with God by doing what he tells us to do. You say, well, I just, it's just too hard. I just, I can't forgive, you know. I, I, I can't do this. I can't do that. And the point is, is we can if we really want to. And until we take responsibility for that, we are never, ever, ever going to get out of the messes that we're in. You do not have to live head over heels in debt. It's just become a way of life. For Americans, we don't want to wait on anything. We want instant gratification. And to be honest with you, we think that we need a whole lot more <laughs> than what we really need. And so, if you've gotten yourself in a mess, God will help you get out of it. He may do some outrageous miracle and you have to do nothing. That does occasionally happen, but it is not the norm. And if you sit around and wait for that, you may be very disappointed. So there is another way, and that way is to not only just attend a church and maybe read a couple of verses a day in the Bible and spend five minutes in prayer, but it's to really get wholly committed to a walk with God, wholly committed, and ask Him to make your life whole and realize that God's going to show you things to do and show you things not to do, and you need to do them and not make excuses. And so the reason why I have all this stuff up here is because I just kind of thinking when I was preparing for this series that there are gamblers and there are investors. There are people who do the wrong thing, know down deep inside they're doing the wrong thing, but they gamble that they can do the wrong thing and avoid the consequence. And then there are people who invest. They do the right thing. See, when you obey your conscience, you are investing. When you get good sleep every night, you're investing. When you eat too much junk, you're gambling. If you're a workaholic, you're gambling. You're gambling that you can do nothing but work and still have a family who loves you and you feel close to, but there's only one thing that makes relationships good and that's time. Not money, time. It's not what we buy our kids that they remember us for, it's the time. Come on, it's the time that we spend with them. And so really you might actually say that every decision that we make, and there are many of them all throughout every day. I don't think, I don't even think that we could count the decisions we make. I mean, each one of us has probably already made a hundred and it's just, you know, not even noon. 
And so we're making decisions all the time, decisions about what we're going to think, what we're going to let in our mind, what we're going to put out of our mind, what we're going to say, what we're going to wear, what we're going to eat, how we're going to act, the attitudes we're going to have. I mean, we're just making decisions all day long. And a decision is a seed that we sow. Every decision is a seed that we sow. And the Bible says that we reap only according to how we sow. If you sow to the flesh, you'll reap from the flesh. Even tells you what you'll reap. Ruin, decay, destruction. <laughs> that means, sowing to the flesh means you follow your flesh. You know down deep inside what you should do, but you just do something else. And you know, I really do not believe that when people do wrong things, that, that they're thinking, now I'm going to do this, I know I'm going to get a bad consequence, but I'm going to do it anyway. They don't think like that. They think they're going to get by with it. They think they'll be the one that can do it and still get blessed. Or maybe they can just do it that one time and still get blessed. I think there's a lot of that. But you know what happens? If you get by with it once and you want to do it twice and then a third time and then a fourth and a fifth and then pretty soon everything comes crashing down on your head and you're like, I don't know what happened. But then, thank God, there are those investors in life. There are those people who do the right thing on the front end, even though it's not easy, even though it requires discipline and effort. Maybe while somebody else is out having fun, they decide to spend time with God, or, you know, maybe instead of running around with the everybody else, they've got elderly parents, and so they decide on Sunday afternoon instead of going to the picnic with everybody else. They just feel in their heart they need to go see mom, they need to go see dad. Maybe nothing real exciting in the flesh about it to go sit in the nursing home and visit them, but they know inside that's what they need to do. Those people are investing. Investing. We have got to learn how to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit for our lives and stop just doing what we think, what we want, and what we feel. Amen? Some of you are real happy, some aren't sure. Because <laughs> see, even when I said that about visiting parents, <laughs> I probably lost 500 people right there just. <laughs> and then, and here's one thing. Well, they never did anything for me. Man, I used that excuse for a long time. God said, you're breathing, aren't you? And see, the, the good news of the gospel is by the power of the Holy Ghost, you can be good to somebody who wasn't good to you. And that's what makes you like God. That's when we're like Him the most. We're being merciful and kind and, and patient and good to people who don't deserve it and really should have punishment. So you have to make a decision if you're going to be a gambler are an investor. I think on a daily basis, if you want to be really spiritually healthy and grow in God, you have to learn how to be obedient to your conscience. Your conscience is a wonderful organ that God has put in you. And some people suffer from excessive guilt. Their conscience is not functioning properly. They feel guilty about everything. But if you can really learn the word and learn the difference between conviction and condemnation, Think about that. There's a difference between conviction and condemnation. People who just feel guilty all the time are more than likely not being convicted by the Holy Spirit. They're being condemned by the devil. He doesn't want you to enjoy anything that you do. Nothing that you do. But through the Word of God, you can learn about all that and you can come to the point where you can trust your conscience to let you know when you're doing something that's okay, you feel peace about it, and when you need to back off. And really, if our conscience tells us not to do something, we don't even need to know why. Part of our problem is, and you'll see that a little bit today, we just want to know why about too much. We're like little kids. Why, Daddy? Why, Daddy? Why? 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 Well, when are we going to get there? Or why are we going this way? And you know, as parents, you get so tired of answering all those questions. 
And can we just say that God knows a whole bunch of stuff that he ain't going to tell you? Now, if you hang in there, you will find out day by day as you walk it out. But God's not going to give you a blueprint for your whole life. It's going to take a lot of T-R-U-S-T, trust. It's all about trusting God. But if we can learn how to obey our conscience and follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And as I said, we don't always even have to know why we don't feel right about something. If you don't feel right about it, then you just need to not do it. And I don't even feel like I have to go around explaining that to people anymore. Because sometimes what God tells you to do or not to do does not make any sense to you, let alone to anybody else. Oh, what do you mean you can't go? Why can't you go? There's nothing. Wrong. I don't know. I just, <laughs> just feel like I need to not do that. Maybe it's just to honor God. Maybe it's just training in obedience. I don't know. We don't have to know everything. We just need to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know it's a little bit scary to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit? Because we're kind of like, well, what's going to happen next? So we want to be spiritually healthy, and we do that by coming to Christ, developing an intimate relationship with Him, and learning how to obey our conscience. Today we want to talk about mental health. How is your mental health? Are you mentally ill? <laughs> and most people think, oh no, thank God I haven't gone that far. Well, you may change your mind before the day is over. <laughs> because I think probably a lot of us are mentally ill as far as God's concerned. <laughs> We're not functioning mentally the way God intended us to function. He wants us to have peace of mind and a whole bunch of other things that we're going to talk about. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 says that His divine power has bestowed on us, that means given to us, all things, say all things, that are requisite and suited to life and godliness. So God's given us everything we need to have a great life. And they come through the full personal knowledge of Him. So you're not going to have this great life through your friend's great relationship with God. Or because you've got an awesome pastor that's got a great relationship with God. You have to have your own deep, intimate, personal relationship with God. And there's only one way to get it, and that's put time and effort into it. <laughs> Nobody can pray it off on you. You can pray for somebody to do what they need to do to draw close to God, but you can't just pray for them to be close to God. <laughs> I think a lot of times we just pray for God to do a whole bunch of stuff that He don't have any intentions of doing. He'll help us do it, but He never intended to go do it all Himself. We're partners with God. We work together in partnership with God. He gives us the strength. We do the doing in many instances. And then it says, who has called us by and to his own glory and excellence. I love that because God has not called us to be mediocre and sloppy and lazy and lukewarm and pathetic and pitiful. He's called us to be excellent. And that means we have to make excellent choices. Paul told the Philippians in Philippians chapter 1 to learn how to choose and prize what is excellent and of real value, learning how to recognize the highest and the best. Don't just do what you have to do to barely get by. Always go the extra mile, especially when nobody's looking. Did you hear what I said? Especially when nobody's looking. We have to learn to live before an audience of one. God is watching all the time. He sees everything. We live too much for people and not enough for God. And then verse 4 says that by means of these promises, we can escape the rottenness and the corruption that's in the world. Paul said that I may know him in the power of his resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead even while I'm in the body. So we can be in the world and yet really 
for all intent and purposes not be affected by it. There's a way that we can live, a life that we can live, where we don't have to live upset all the time, wondering about what people are thinking of us. We don't have to worry about the economy and the future and what's going to happen in the world. We just walk it out day by day and believe that if we've done what God's asked us to do, that He's going to do what He said He would do. And we might have to make a few adjustments, but if we do, He'll give us the grace to do that. We don't have to worry about these things. For this reason, verse 5, now here comes your part. Those first couple of verses are God's part. Here's your part. Add your diligence to the promises. Employ every effort in exercising. Now there's three words right there that just give us the creepy crawlies in our flesh. <laughs> diligence, effort, and exercise all in one sentence. Come on now. We got to do more than sit in the recliner with the remote control pushing buttons. We crab because we have to unload the automatic dishwasher. <laughs> oh, yeah, I have to unload the dishwasher. <clears throat> Exercise your faith to develop virtue and excellence and resolution, Christian energy. And in exercising virtue, develop knowledge. And in exercising knowledge, develop self-control. Uh-oh, there we go. Now I'm preaching good. And we're going to talk specifically today about controlling your thoughts. Because see, people like to have the idea, well, I can't help it. I can't help what's in my head. You may not be able to do anything about what comes into your mind, but you don't have to keep it and think about it. I just want to finish this. We're going to go right to this stuff about the mind. And as you develop self-control, exercise self-control, then you'll develop steadfastness, patience, endurance. And in exercising steadfastness, you'll develop godliness, and in exercising godliness, you'll develop brotherly affection, and in exercising brotherly affection, you'll finally come to the end fulfillment of what God has called us for, which is real Christian agape love. We're on a journey, and our journey is to learn how to not be selfish and self-centered, but live our lives to be a blessing everywhere that we go. And in the midst of that, our flesh screams out, well, what about me? <laughs> and if we can just see it, if we will be willing to stop trying to take care of ourselves, God will take care of us. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, casting all your care on him, for he careth for you affectionately. So many people just need to retire from self-care let God do the job that he's good at. Get up every day, tend to God's business, he'll tend to yours. Find somebody to be a blessing to, keep yourself off your mind, and you'll be surprised how happy you'll get. God will just sneak up on you with blessings that you can't even imagine. Now Romans 15, first three verses. We who are strong in our convictions and of robust faith ought to bear with the failings and the frailties and the tender scruples of the weak. We ought to help carry the doubts and qualms of others and not live to please ourselves. <laughs> Can you just say with me today, I am not here to please myself. Now I know a lot of you don't believe that yet, but it's nice to get you saying it. <laughs> Let each one of us make it a practice, and practice means you do it over and over, to please and make happy his neighbor for his good and for his true welfare living to edify him, to strengthen him, and to build him up spiritually. <laughs> For Christ did not please himself. He gave no thought to his own interest. Isn't that an amazing scripture? I really believe that's our journey. I honestly believe, and I've been at this a long time. I've been a Christian for lots and lots and lots of years, and I've been in ministry 32 years, teaching the word 32 years. And Believe me, I've tried every way that anybody could possibly try to be happy. 
And the only thing I've come up with that works is what Jesus said. Forget yourself. <laughs> Get your mind off yourself. What people are not doing for you, what people are doing to you, what they ought to do for you, they're not doing for you. What they think about you, how they look at you, how they treat you. The truth of the matter is, is we're so concerned about what people think, and most of them ain't thinking about us at all. Because <laughs> they're too busy thinking about themselves. <laughs> I wonder what they think. Do they think I look okay? You think they like my new hair? We've got to get all that junk off our minds and purposely get our minds on how we can be a blessing to somebody else. I've tried every way imaginable, and this is the only way that I've found that work. It's kind of interesting. Jesus did say it a long time ago. If you want to be my disciple, forget yourself, lose sight of yourself and all your own interests. Take up your cross and follow me. Oh, gee, it was there all the time. I think I read that about 32 years ago. I wonder why I had to go through another 25 years of misery before I decided to do it God's way. Because, see, I didn't want to give nothing up. <laughs> I wanted to make my plan and have everybody in the world serve my plan. And even though it was clear right there in the Word of God, I just kept hoping that I could do it the wrong way and not get a consequence, but I kept getting a consequence, which was I had no joy, no peace. And nothing seemed to be working out right in my life. It's amazing how things work out good if you just do them God's way. Can anybody say amen? amen. I'm sure that anybody who's been around the Word very long is familiar with 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5. But let's just put it up on the screen so we can have a look at it. An obedient mind leads to an obedient life. You absolutely cannot have the life that Jesus died for you to have if you're going to let your mind be a mess. A sick mind creates a sick life. 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5 says, The weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. A stronghold is a place where an enemy digs in captures an area and buries himself in it. And that's what the devil wants to do in our minds. He wants to have strongholds in our minds so he can capture an area of our thinking and own that area. Inasmuch as we refute arguments, how many of you know that your mind will argue with you? <laughs> and theories you realize we come up with a lot of theories and reasonings. Well, that can't be God. Well, how's that going to work? Well, hmm. And every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. And we lead, we lead, not God, we lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ, the anointed one. So we have to guard our heart with all diligence for out of it flows the issues of life. To guard something means to watch very carefully that nothing gets in that shouldn't be in and should anything get in that shouldn't be in, it is immediately thrown out. We have to guard our heart. We do it. Do you understand that? We do it. Stop praying for God to do something that he's giving you the strength to do. I really do believe that this is a real problem. I think we think that just because we pray, now God's going to do everything. And we dare not try to do anything without prayer because when we pray, we get God's help. God gives us the ability, the strength to do what we should be doing. Grace is not an excuse to sin and live a sloppy life. Grace is the power of the Holy Spirit to enable us to say no to sin and yes to God. Our thought life is critical if we want a whole and healthy life. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 says, 
to strip yourselves of your farmer nature and be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind and to put on the new nature that's been created in God's image. I love those scriptures. 